Welcome to this video about gold mining in California. This PowerPoint video covers the fascinating history of the Rand Gold Mining District. It was prepared by Buena Vista Museum of Natural History and Science. We invite you to visit us at 2018 Chester Avenue in downtown Bakersfield, California. Please visit our website www.buenavistamuseum.org. You see a map of California's historic gold mines. Gold was discovered in the 1770s in the southeastern part of the state. The 1848 Sutter's Mill Marshall gold discovery on the American River led to the 1849 gold rush. The gold rich belt south of the Marshall discovery became known as the Mother Lode, which is highlighted red. There were numerous gold discoveries in the Mojave Desert in the 1890s. You'll learn the story of one of these, the Rand District, which is filled with intrigue, chicanery, and luck. The Rand District is marked by the 1895 Green Star. The Rand Mining District is highlighted by the green box on this satellite image. The Rand District is in the Rand Mountains of the northern Mojave Desert about 120 miles north of Los Angeles. Kern County, California, having produced over 4 million ounces of gold, is the most gold productive county in California outside the Mother Lode. The star of this video, the Rand District, is in far eastern Kern County and is highlighted green. It has produced more than 2.25 million ounces of gold. Through 1939, initial district production of 1.25 million ounces was worth $20 million. Rand district operations largely ceased in 1939, but a reactivation of open pit areas collectively known as the Rand mine by Glamis Gold occurred in 1986. New mining from 1986 to 2003 resulted in recovery of an additional 1 million ounces of gold worth $350 million. Silver is chemically combined with the gold in the Rand District ore and provided byproduct value. No new commercial mining has occurred since 2003. A cluster of towns developed around the Rand District mines after 1895. The satellite photo shows the two most prominent towns, Randsburg and Johannesburg. Disturbed land caused by mining is still evident. The Rand District was named for the Witwatersrand Rand District in South Africa, which boomed after 1886. Naming of towns followed suit. By far the most productive Rand District mine was the Yellow Astern Mine, named for a pulp novel popular at the time. Yellow Astern Mining started in 1895 as a surface mine but productive veins were quickly traced underground and by 1905, 7.5 miles of underground workings were in place. A large open pit, which opened in 1905, provided most of the ore during the Yellow Aster's life, but underground mining continued while the pit was operating. Only the hardiest of prospectors could deal with the challenges of hunting for gold and silver in the Mojave Desert. California gold prospecting declined in the 1860s to virtually nothing after California's celebrated gold rush from 1849 to 1855. So why did post-Civil War prospecting occur in the desolate territory anyway? The federal government encouraged civilization of the West via the Homestead Act of 1862, the General Mining Act of 1872, and the Desert Lands Act of 1877. Some fortune seekers that came were Civil War veterans that didn't adjust to life back east after the Civil War. Most folks ceased prospecting empty-handed, but a few lucky prospectors made a find, quickly sold out to speculators, then moved on. Desert gold and silver prospecting was attractive on public lands after the huge silver discovery at Virginia City, Nevada in 1859 and the Bodie, California gold strike that same year which peaked between 1877 and 1882. In the 1870s through the 1890s, financial markets and federal legislation greatly influenced capital availability and thus Western prospecting. The Coinage Act of 1873 immediately depressed silver prices. 
thus hurting prospecting in the West. But silver was king in the California desert between 1878 and 1893 after passage of the Bland-Allison Act in 1878. A run on U.S. Treasury gold in 1893 by foreign interests, plus the loss of price supports for silver that same year, caused a financial panic. The poster you see advertises a Broadway melodrama about the Panic of 1893. But the panic also reinvigorated gold prospecting in the West. Several Mojave Desert gold discoveries were made during the mid-1890s, including the Rand District. So, who were the prospectors involved in the Rand District gold discovery, and how was the discovery made? The photo shows the discovery party in May of 1895, the month after finding gold. Two of the three credited discoverers are in the photo. John Singleton, a carpenter by trade, is second from the left, and Frederick Moores, a journalist, is in the far right. The third discoverer, Charles Burcham, a butcher, will appear in a later photo. If you ever doubt the lure of gold, consider Frederick Moores. Moores was a Brooklyn journalist sent west to cover the decline of western mining. Instead of writing, he got bitten by the gold bug himself and turned into a successful prospector and a rich man. However, he soon got divorced and died from alcoholism at age 52, five years after his Rand District discovery. The photo at bottom left shows the same 1895 camp with the same four men next to a dry washer. Dry washers were devices used to separate placer gold from worthless rock using the power of desert wind and gravity when no water was available. These prospectors were initially looking for nuggets like the Randsburg area nuggets pictured in the top right. The Moore's Bircham Singleton prospecting trio had been grub staked by Bircham's wife, Dr. Rose Bircham. Her role in the discovery, development, and operation of the Yellow Aster Mine can't be overstated, as you'll see. In addition to having a female authority, the Yellow Aster was also unique in that it was one of the few major Mojave mines to be retained and developed by the original locators. The April 1895 discovery made by Moores, Bircham, and Singleton is legendary. The three men set off from a camp of prospectors gathered 10 miles northwest of the ultimate discovery site. The camp was at the Gola Gulch Placer Gold Discovery in the El Paso Mountains. The three drove their wagon in a circuitous route so other prospectors could not follow them south into the Rand Mountains. The three were dry washing in the mountains when Singleton broke off a piece of hard rock that showed gold. They knew finding gold in place in an outcrop, not just in a broad area where nuggets had washed in, was important. Moores immediately stated, We're rich, by George. Singleton, we found it. The cabbage-sized, gold-rich stone later assayed in Los Angeles for $950. you see an undated portrait of the three discoverers. The trio knew they had to keep their discovery quiet, at least until the location was staked and paperwork filed to authenticate their discovery claim. They also knew that other prospectors, unaware of the discovery, were following them. So they returned to the Golar Gulch camp and sort of announced their discovery. Knowing that skeptical prospectors would want to see what the trio found, the Moores group, considered amateurs, purposely loaded sacks of worthless iron-stained quartz in their wagon. Curious miners asked Burcham if he had found anything worthwhile. Burcham stubbornly admitted, well, I just don't know, but I think we might have found something pretty good. So when the Moores group wasn't looking, prospecting veterans perused the sacks. Satisfied that the Moores group Greenhorns had brought back worthless rock, the veterans were no longer alarmed. Once the discovery was made, Rose Burcham became a leader of the group. She, along with husband Charles Burcham, legally secured the claims in San Bernardino by June of 1895. When Charles offered to pay Rose back her 16.5% grub stake, 
she strongly counseled him not to sign any document with anyone until the true value of the discovery could be determined. Her advice saved the Yellow Aster's discoverers from the usual fate of selling out too soon and too low. She knew the three men were subject to the sellout temptation after eating beans and bacon for months. Sure enough, out in the desert, Moores and Singleton actually entered into an agreement to sell 50% of the yet-to-be-mined mine. But they needed Charles Burcham's signature when he returned from San Bernardino. Remembering what Rose said, Charles Burcham refused to sign on June 22, 1895. Rose Burcham then closed her medical practice and moved to the Rand camp in July of 1895, the height of the brutal Mojave Desert summer. She then functioned as the mine's business manager, bookkeeper, and secretary for many years. Pictured is the town of Randsburg in 1897. By the end of 1895, there were 13 buildings there, mostly glorified canvas tents. Less than two years later, the Rand camp became the town of Randsburg. By February of 1897, the number of unofficial mining claims had exploded to 4,300. It is estimated that the Ransburg area had 5,000 residents by spring of 1897. In 1898, however, two major fires swept through Ransburg and destroyed the main business district, but the town quickly recovered. As with many new discoveries, Mechanical devices to process the gold ore had to be acquired. The lack of water or a railroad to bring supplies to the Rand Mountains were hindrances in 1896 and 1897 and required ore to be processed elsewhere. The photo shows the first load of yellow aster gold ore leaving to be processed at Garlock 10 miles away. Eventually four small stamp mills crushed ore at Garlock. But in 1898, a new 30-stamp mill came to Randsburg, and a 50-stamp mill in Barstow was employed as well. When a permanent source of water came to Randsburg in 1898 via a pipeline from the north, Garlock quickly became a ghost town. Pictured is a group of underground miners at the Yellow Aster Mine in 1904. Working in a remote location where summers were hot, winters were cold, water and supplies were scarce, the wind always blew, and female companionship was minimal, was hard. Of desert residents, it has been said, prospectors are born to wander, but cursed to stay and dig. Pictured is a typical bar scene in Randsburg. The Randsburg newspaper said what this town needs is more water and less whiskey. By 1897, no less than 24 saloons existed in Randsburg. The railroad arrived in 1898, not to Randsburg, but to a new adjacent town two miles east, Johannesburg. Randsburg had the familiar boomtown trappings of saloons, entertainment houses, and a red light district. But Johannesburg wanted to be considered a more genteel planned community of mills, railroads, and services to the mining district. Joburg, as it was called, continued the trend of South African names in the Rand district. Discoveries of silver and tungsten in the early 1900s kept Joburg and adjacent mining communities Red Mountain and Atolia alive. In this staged photo, workers use an air-driven drill underground in 1900. Though the photo was taken in a Sierra Nevada mine, is typical of mining underground in the Rand district. These drills were often called widow makers because of their tendency to cause rock falls and the danger in using a powerful drill in tight spaces. After drilling, dynamite was placed in the drilled holes and subsequently exploded, loosening the ore. Ore would then be carried out of the mine via ore carts and processed to separate valuable minerals from gang or worthless rock. Pictured is part of Randsburg's giant 100 stamp mill that crushed gold ore. Ore was crushed by 100 reciprocating metal pistons known as stamps. 
the liberated gold adhered to mercury on gently inclined sluiceways as water carried worthless finds away. In this photo, each sluice has at least five vertical stamps. Other smaller stamp mills at the Johannesburg Railroad terminus two miles from Randsburg processed ore locally. Imagine the noise of being inside this building when the stamps were operating. Efficiency of gold recovery from mined rock will make or break the economics of gold mining. An 1890s worldwide technical improvement to gold extraction was the introduction of cyanide to recover gold from crushed ore. The picture shows men dumping crushed ore into cyanide vats at a Mojave Desert mine around 1900. Still used today, cyanide was found to extract up to 96% of the gold, a far greater recovery than from mercury amalgamation. At the Yellow Aster, 500,000 ounces of gold was recovered by mercury amalgamation through 1939. However, retreating 700,000 tons of ore with cyanide after amalgamation yielded another 41,000 ounces of gold. An issue that plagued the Yellow Aster mine throughout its existence was labor strife. Pictured are scab workers hired to replace striking miners at a Yellow Aster entrance in 1903. Photos of mine crews often contained a dog. This dog, like some of the miners, is unidentified. This photo looks down upon train tracks converging away from underground entrances to the Yellow Aster mine. One of the new stamp mills is seen in the upper part of the photo. The photo date is between 1901 and 1905. This yellow aster photo taken about 1930 is basically the reverse angle of the previous photo. It shows a head frame and train tracks leading into the underground mine workings at the red arrow. Mountains and open pit workings are beyond the underground entrance. Mining companies raised capital via stock offerings. Pictured is a Yellow Aster stock certificate issued in 1903. Co-signers of the certificate are President John Singleton, one of the three founders of the mine, and Secretary Rose Lamont Burcham. The Yellow Aster wasn't the only profitable mine in the Rand District. The Yellow Aster is credited with $12 million of gold, the Butte Mine $2 million, and the Sunshine Mine, 1.06 million. Pictured is the hard cash mine about 1900. According to a state report from 1962, no gold production was ever recorded at the hard cash mine, but other sources suggest any hard cash gold production was lumped into the Yellow Aster's total after the Yellow Aster took the mine over in 1904. In the early years of the Rand District, Lack of lumber, lack of water, and a lack of money meant some miners literally scratched out a living. Pictured is a dugout home, little more than a stone refuge from the elements. The Rand District social scene included time for play. A shocking fact is that one of the first golf courses in California was built at Johannesburg. The photo on the right shows a golfer teeing off at the Johannesburg Jackrabbit Golf Course. Other players sit and wait their turn. The image is a late 1890s black and white photo superimposed onto a modern photo of the same site. The photo on the left shows Johannesburg residents dressed up for golf. For the geologically inclined, here is a geologic map. Note that the green star of the Yellow Aster Mine is where two host rock types, schist and quartz monzonite, meet. The gold ore is found in microcrystalline quartz veins that occur along fracture fillings and fault surfaces of the two rock types. The host rocks are much older than the gold. The gold was emplaced as cooling hot water, known as hydrothermal fluids, brought dissolved gold into the host rocks 14 to 19 million years ago. Note two other green stars nearby. After gold was discovered in 1895, major deposits of tungsten, 1906, and silver, 1918, were made near Ransburg. 
To understand how much gold is in rock prior to major mining efforts, cores are drilled into the ground. In this yellow aster core photograph, you can see microcrystalline quartz, which is white, mixed in with altered mica-rich rock, which is gray and orange. The orange is due to iron being oxidized in the fractured rock. Gold is often not visible in the ore, though the red arrow points to a tiny accumulation in this rock. As mentioned earlier, most mining at the Yellow Aster shut down in 1939. Diminishing profit in a labor strike in December of 1939 caused the shutdown. But when the federal government declared gold non-essential to the World War II effort in 1942, the temporary Yellow Aster closure became permanent. However, the 1986 open pit reactivation greatly deepened the existing pit. Pictured is an aerial view of the pit after newer mining ended in 2003. The Glamis Gold Project averaged 0 0.0. 025 ounces of gold per ton of rock. That concentration is equivalent to having about one tiny BB of gold in a basketball sized rock. The 17 year mining project recovered just over 1 million ounces of gold, twice as much as the earlier mining. So where did the wealth from early Rand district mining go? Much went towards legal matters. But discoverer Frederick Moores purchased a mansion built in 1894 in Los Angeles that still stands today. The 1898 purchase price, $10,000. The Frederick Mitchell Moores House at 818 South Bonnie Bray Street is on the National Register of Historic Places. As mentioned earlier, Moore's death occurred in 1900, two years after he purchased the house. Moore's estate at death was valued at $755,000. One of the Moore's heirs was Edward Demarest, or E.D. Moore's. He was part owner of the Yellow Aster Mine. E.D. Moore's married a silent film star, Decisha Seville, in 1917 and influenced her film career. Decisha Moore's portrait and a movie poster of her in The Blonde Vampire appear on this slide. Have you been bitten by the gold bug yet? Here is one last teaser slide. On the left is the Mojave Nugget, the largest gold nugget ever found in the Randsburg area. The nearly 11 pound nugget was discovered in 1977, five miles south of Randsburg with a metal detector. The Randsburg Garlock area remains a popular place for gold prospectors. This video has just scratched the surface of Randsburg's history. That history is preserved at the Rand Desert Museum. You can view displays and artifacts of the old mining days around Randsburg by visiting the museum on Butte Avenue, the main street through Old Randsburg. Though Buena Vista Museum does not have a gold mining display, we do show gold ore and a gold nugget from Randsburg on special occasions. Thank you for viewing this video, and thanks to those folks who assisted in making this presentation. Look for other videos regarding Kern County's geology and mineral history. We invite you to visit Buena Vista Museum of Natural History and Science in Bakersfield, California, or visit our website at www.buenavistamuseum.org.